Act, I've sent an open letter to Gavin Newsom, the governor. Not only have we seen the cost of almost everything go up exponentially in the last few years, in addition to new regulations, new mandates, they come with a cost burden. We you know recently had to switch from compostable plastic cutlery to bamboo cutlery, you know. Just little things like this might have some minor environmental benefit, but they end up coming at an additional cost. If I were to match our increased costs with menu pricing, we would be forced to charge like $40 for a cheeseburger. We can't explain that to the customer. My guest today is Brian Back. He's a restauranteur from Northern California. Brian started his restaurant so it can become an asset for the community and bring people together. Today, he's here to tell us what's happening with restaurants across California and the challenges they're facing with laws and regulations and rising costs. We also talked to John Kavatak, who's the president of MFIB, who has seen a number of restaurants and restaurant owners in his portfolio of members who are facing challenges in California. I wanted to do something that was neighborhood scaled. I wanted to do something in my community. I wanted to have a place where family could be generating tax revenue and building community. I was naive until I opened this business that the state could come in and just pull the money out. It was a little bit shocking. I'm Siama Korami. Welcome to California Insider. Brian, it's great to have you on. Welcome. Thank you, CMAC. It's great to be here. Brian, you wrote an open letter to the governor. You are a restaurant owner in the Bay Area, and you requested some help. Can you tell us what you're going through? Yes. Yeah, so I, in 2018, opened a uh, beer garden and barbecue restaurant out of an abandoned gas station and mechanic shop. So we upcycled a, a property that was uh, kind of sad to look at and was not generating any tax revenue and uh, turned it into you know a restaurant community gathering place and in that time we've obviously seen quite a bit happen you know we had a pandemic and uh, we've had inflation woes and we've had unfortunately a climate where we've lost hundreds of restaurants in the Bay Area and more throughout the state of California and so these issues that I've confronted as a restaurant owner, as a small business owner, mom and pop scale, I've written in an essay form, I've uh, communicated with my local media, local politicians, I've sent an open letter to Gavin Newsom, the governor, on more than one occasion. Unfortunately, I've, I've run into dead ends. Um, no reply from the governor's office. Um, I've had limited discussions with my local senator, there's a, actually an office of the small business advocate in the state of California, but they were basically told me they couldn't help me. And what are these issues that you guys are facing? Can you tell us, the average people, what's going on? Sure. In space? Not only have we seen the cost of almost everything go up exponentially in the last few years, especially coming out of the pandemic, I think that small businesses get a lot of lip service of, yeah, we support small business, we have Small Business Month. But where the rubber meets the road in terms of policy, what we're seeing is a, not even a slow drip, but a fast drip of new regulations that are coming down the pipeline uh, nonstop. In the super majority where anyone with a pet project can get what they want passed, legislation that has noble ideas, we wanna provide this, we wanna do this for the environment, uh, et cetera. There's the, the new administrative layers and, and regulations imposed on small business become overwhelming. And so someone of uh, my scale as a restaurant to try to make something happen with a small staff, eke out a living, it's become overwhelming and impossible. And the state uh, has, in my experience, been very aggressive and very punitive and not responsive to the issues that we're facing. Was there a moment for you when you figured out that uh, the policies are kind of getting away, going far? And you, you agreed with some of these policies, right? Yeah, I think originally I was, especially when it came to uh, some of the environmental innovation happening in California and green building mandates and that sort of thing. Because what I wanted to do with the, with the property uh, where we have the restaurant was to really, you know, upcycle a former gas station, you know, a, a a sort of monument to the fossil fuel industry and turn it into a community gathering place. And I wanted to do these green building initiatives and I wanted to have, you know, something that was, you know, a great asset to the, the community. And so I came in, in with very noble ideas. 
the just the permitting process around doing that became so overwhelming and cumbersome that it became a, a, a serious financial liability for me. So I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do because it took me three years to open you know what was already an existing site <laughs> the building we didn't change the building and start from scratch you know it was just upcycling it putting in some new utilities and that sort of thing I had to deal with um, so many difficulties in that process that came at such a severe financial cost to me that by the time that I opened the restaurant and launched my small business on Main Street I had no cash and that's not how you want to open a restaurant no cash cushion sacrificing some of the the ideals that I had uh, not being able to invest more in my employees in my community in my business and that was very difficult now, having gone through all that I admittedly had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder a little bit of resentment towards the permitting authorities in the, in the county in the town in the state and then came COVID <laughs> right around the corner and we went through all that and then emerged from that and so we slowly built this business up and have made incredible memories and have had great experiences. There's times when I'm, when I'm there and I'm looking out across the beer garden on a beautiful spring day and there's a, a band playing and uh, the employees are making jokes and the customers are laughing and chatting and you see someone celebrating a birthday party and you see a little league team and you think, oh, this is, this is great. You know, this is what, this is the vision. Um, and so there's moments like that where I really do find, you know, deep appreciation for what we've built. But unfortunately, there continues to be a very aggressive and punitive approach from state authorities. We just got targeted for a sales tax audit, um, for example, um, even though our restaurant earns less annual income than uh, far less than the median house price in the community we serve. It's bewildering and challenging. And you mentioned that as these things piled up together, different regulations come in and they're piling up. Can mm -hmm. you explain that? How does it impact you guys? Because it seems like these yeah. incremental laws are passing. A business of my scale, a mom and pop scale, it means that I'm the one who's doing the payroll. I'm the one that's doing the bookkeeping. I'm the one that's uh, doing the compliance with, uh, with the state, um, ordering inventory, you know, you name it, endless paperwork on the back end. Every time a new rule or uh, initiative is passed, it creates another administrative layer, something more that I have to do. So if you're working 70 hours a week and all the time that you're not working in the restaurant, you're working on the restaurant, to have anything more is just, it becomes to the point where, you, you know, it's near impossible to do it with the resources that you have. And then the cost of things too. I mean, it's everything that we see with, with new regulations, new mandates, they come with a cost burden. We recently had to switch from compostable plastic cutlery to bamboo cutlery. Just little things like this. Um, they sound little and trivial and, and might have some minor environmental benefit, but they end up coming at an additional cost. We mentioned Prop 12 retirement obligations, you name it, it's just every month there's something new that we have to do that creates a new administrative layer and a new cost. And, and these, are these state mandated laws? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, state, some are, some are county as well and local, but, um, but a lot of it's from the state. To understand if this is a trend in the state with restaurants, we talked to John Kavitak. Can you give us some examples of these regulations? I know there's a lot of them. Can you give us some thoughts of what these regulations look like? Sure. I was with the California Restaurant Association for about four years, but we talk to our NFIB members all the time, many of them restaurateurs, many of them small businesses, and they're just facing a wall of problems. First of all, we have, you know, the, again, in addition to the minimum wage, which is, you know, continues, either our policymakers continue to feel like it's never enough uh, to raise it high enough for small business owners, which hurts the very employees. But we've got a ton of other regulations that small business owners must have to deal with. California right now already has offers, empl requires employers to offer their workers upwards of 15 to 16 different employee leave programs. Okay, that's the most in the country. 
And with each of those, my friend, comes a cost. Each of those comes a cost. So um, the employee leave programs from family medical leave to you know, recent ones that were signed by the governor that now require ones for uh, additional members of the family. Um, it's just when is too much too much? Uh, so these employee leave programs are another big problem. Uh, we also have found that small business owners must abide by so many local ordinances, health and safety requirements. Nobody wants a workplace that's not safe, but I think we're now finding them heaped on with so many requirements at that level. Uh, and then to your point, I think they also live under the specter of fear. Shakedown lawsuits, retail crime, retail threat, theft, that is now affecting a lot of restaurateurs. And we saw an In-N-Out burger uh, uh, you know, in the Bay Area that had to shut down because people were breaking into vehicles and things around that parking lot. Uh, it's just too unsafe. So it's just, I think, what we call death by a thousand cuts. And many of these small business owners are dying by a thousand cuts or more. And then what happens if you don't follow these? To offer a story that is illustrative of the, of the situation that we deal with, at the end of January, January 31st, I'm going to pay my, uh, file and pay my quarterly sales tax. So I do all the work in QuickBooks, all the accounting. I go to all the delivery apps. I find out you know, the amount of money in sales tax we owe. And I'm, I'm going to file and pay. But the power goes out at the restaurant. It's raining. And this happens on a regular basis. Whenever there's rain or high winds, the power goes out. I'm, my internet goes out. I'm not able to pay sales tax. I'm making sure that <laughs> customers are safe, that our employees are safe. We shut down the restaurant. We you know, cut off the power. We get everyone out of there, and I go back and do sales tax within 48 hours. I file it and pay in full. And then a few weeks later, I get a letter in the mail from the state saying, you owe $1,000 in penalties and interest for not paying your sales tax in time. And I say, OK, well, I go on to the website, and I formally make a motion to try to be Appeal relieved that, of that yeah. penalty. Because the power went out, it's out of my control. You can check the records, you know, PG&E's power outages. <laughs> you can see that I was unable to do it. Even though I did that, um, a week after that, the state came into my business's checking account and pulled that $1,000 out. They just went into your, my bank account and took the money. Wow. It's a legal order. This is with just in weeks of the penalty. And so, you know, I contact the state. I say, what's going on? They'd also sent letters threatening that if you don't pay this money by a certain date, we will take away your liquor license, our beer and wine license. So they're doing things like that within all, all compounding within a few weeks of just an incident that was out of my control with the power going out and not being able to, to pay sales tax on time, even though I did that within 48 hours. So that's, that's just kind of an example of what we are dealing with. And when we see, when I see a letter come from the state in the mail, I, I'm like, I get worried, I cringe, I worry, like, what's this gonna be? It's unfortunate. So in this case, they, they didn't really listen to you or, or their reasoning, and they just took the money out of your account. That's right. I was naive until I opened this business that the state could come in and just pull money from your account. When I'm trying to make payroll, when I earn well below a living wage in my community, that they can come into your account and just pull the money out um, is a little bit shocking. Folks, you've probably been hearing me talk about Virify for a while now. Virify has been getting a ton of phone calls from you, and I thank you for supporting an investment that actually helps people. A lot of people are talking about this investment, and i like to review the basics with you. First off, yes, it's true. You can earn up to 10.25% fixed rate of return that's not correlated to the stock market or to the Fed. You can turn your income on or off, compound it, whatever you choose, and there are absolutely no fees. There are no restrictions on your principal if you ever need your money back, and you'll get your monthly statement with no surprises. If you are not sure if you can trust this economy, this secure collateralized portfolio may be a very good option for you. Just go to investyrefi.com. That's invest the letter Y, then refi.com. Folks, I take my endorsements very seriously. 
If you're looking for a solid investment that helps people, contact my friends at Vyrify and then tell them Siamai Karami sent you. Now let's go back to the interview. Do you think it's reached to the point where are you worried more about what's going to come next or is it already this piling up has already reached the maximum limit where a lot of people like yourself may not be able to operate anymore? I think you nailed it there. I mean, we've lost already so many restaurants in the Bay Area. We've lost so many small businesses in the state. Um, people that are leaving with their livelihoods crushed, going to other states, trying something different. My feeling is that it has reached critical mass. I do think we've, we've kind of reached the worst of it, but I don't see that the, the turn in that ship around is going to be easy or quick. So I do hope, I really do hope that things get better from, from my perspective. As a small business person that has worked and contributed to the state for 20 plus years in economic development and generating tax revenue and building community, I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm not able to do it anymore. It's just become too much. I'm spending most of the money that we earn in like debt obligations to the state. So it becomes a sort of economic serfdom. I think that this, this sales tax audit really sort of, it just sort of broke my, my will, um, unfortunately. And I don't really know what's next, but I do think that trying to do what we've been doing has, has sadly become unsustainable. Now, you seem to have started this business with a big vision for the community. Can you tell us what was the, the vision you had for this restaurant? Yeah, in 2014, my beautiful daughter, Annabelle, was born. And at that time, I've been a small business entrepreneur, done previous work in different industries. I've grown up in hospitality. I wanted to do something that was neighborhood scaled. I wanted to do something in my community. I wanted to have a place where for example, I coached my daughter's basketball team at the end of the season every year. We, we have a celebration at the restaurant. But that's when we had a music festival a few weeks ago it's, uh, for, for women in music, and, and my daughter got to perform at it. And so, you know, we want, I wanted something that was neighborhood scaled to build community to really, uh, you know, not have to commute an hour a day back and forth to the city and, and to, to try to just uh, have something neighborhood scaled that had impact in, in, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, one customer at a time. So that was, it was very tangible and hands-on, and that was the vision. Now, do you think the state leaders, the people you have been talking to, do you think they, uh, they may not understand the value of these small businesses, or do you think they just don't know the impact of the laws they're passing on you guys? I do believe that there's got to be some disconnect in terms of understanding of what it really means on the ground. Probably not a lot of, of the policymakers have had small businesses uh, before, like, like at this scale. Or, you know, I think a lot of the policies are noble ideas. We want to create better conditions for, for labor. We want to we wanna have environmental innovations. I think in their minds they're really doing good, but I don't think they understand the true administrative cost on businesses of our scale, whether it comes to what kind of to-go boxes we're using, to uh, employment costs, to... So you have to have a specific to-go boxes? Yeah, they have to <laughs> everything has to be compostable and there's new legislation around um, cutlery, for example. You can't just give out compostable plastic anymore, now it has to be bamboo. So you have to be careful what you give out, right? Yeah, you do. You're not even allowed to give out condiments anymore, you have to ask customers if they want it. We have new requirements now for certifications that all the employees have to have around responsible beverages and, and safe serve for, for food certification. And some people might want to ask this, and uh, why don't you charge more? Can you do that? Yeah, that's a great point, and we unfortunately have customers that, that come in and, and are frustrated at the restaurant for the prices that we have increased. If I were to match our increased costs with menu pricing, we would be uh, forced to charge like $40 for a cheeseburger. We can't explain that to the customer. They will look at your menu pricing and walk out the door upset and go on to Yelp and say, this place is overpriced. And We see that a lot. And we've increased our prices significantly since inflation. But trying to find that balance is very, very tough. Because you would lose the customers, is that? That's right, even though we are 
not raising prices enough to match our increased cost. You can't do it. So if you want, you know, if you want to turn off the, the flow of customers to the restaurant um, or d decrease the amount of, of customers, higher prices will do that. So John, Brian is telling us that it will cost $40 a cheeseburger for his customers if he was to raise that cost to actually what it cost him with the raw materials and the labor and all the regulatory things that he has to go through. Can you tell us, is this real? It's simple math because um, he's only got so much of a budget and what he counts on coming through the door from the customers and what they pay um, and what they bring him in his cash register, right? He's either got to make a decision to let Karen and Steve and Judy go or scale back their shifts, further hurting their productivity, or more likely doing what Brian had to do, which is boost his menu up price to try and hopefully get those customers to pay more. The hard part is many customers out there that are walking through doors like Brian's or other places, they, many of them are minimum wage employees and their families themselves. So it's this absurd cycle um, that you're actually raising the prices in a lot of these minimum wage establishments, but a lot of those customers are actually minimum wage employees themselves on a very limited income and now having to make decisions about where they spend the money to help provide for their family. So um, I don't blame Brian, but it's that cost issue right now where there's so many different la layers. They have no other way to recourse really at this point, but to raise prices or make the more difficult decisions of letting people go or, or scale them back. So it's simple math, but it's scary math. And unfortunately, people like Brian are becoming more and more of the, is the people that we're hearing from is out there. In this business, there's a, there's a, there's a few that just kind of found the right formula in the right place at the right time and have, have good fortune and, and, and kind of have a good run for a few years and then there's the other 80 percent that are struggling right now. Every restaurateur I speak to is dealing with this what I call a cost and compliance epidemic and having a tough time and figuring out how to make it through. The thing is I, I can imagine for example in my restaurant a time a few decades ago when what I am doing and what we are doing would have been enough. Enough to eke out a humble existence you know to to have a middle class or even upper middle class existence with being able to afford decent decent housing and to just be able to maintain a, a lifestyle around the amount of business that we do you know we do we're we have customers that love the restaurant in the spring summer and fall we have a lot of traffic that comes through and a lot of appreciation for it and it's it seems like there there was a time when that would have been enough. And nowadays it's just not viable, unfortunately. Do you think regulators are seeing this or do you think regulators are not seeing that these restaurants like yourself are not able to continue if they continue adding more and more? They have to be seeing it from a data perspective when they see the, the businesses that are closing and, and those that are leaving the state. You know, My hope is that there will be a point where the tide can really turn, but it's not, I'm not seeing it on the immediate horizon in terms of what's happening in Sacramento. Before we continue, we would like to thank Shen Yun for sponsoring this channel. It takes you back in time to magical world of ancient China with a unique blend of brilliant dancing, beautiful costumes, and legends coming to life. Go to ShenYun.com to find out the schedule and theater information. It's a lifetime experience you don't want to miss. Just so inspiring. It makes me want to go dance. Breathtaking. It's very impressed. I'm taking my program and I'm going to mention it on the news because I think it's a great performance and people should see it. What I loved about the show was the authenticity of it. It was taking me on a journey. Exceptional. The technique involved that. The thousands of hours of training people just float. Everything was exact and then they worked to the exact moment and it was beautiful. You go away feeling with a smile in your heart from it. Have to come. Life changing. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Don't wait. Don't Get your tickets wait. now. If tomorrow the governor and the state leaders decide to make a pivot and help mm -hmm people like you and your community, the restaurant owners, what can they do? 
what are the few things that they can do that will change the whole dynamic? I think I think number one would be to to reevaluate the uh, the tax policies, and that's that's a big one because obviously you have you have it in multiple places. You have you know you have property taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, payroll taxes, all of which are extraordinarily high, and so when it comes to businesses, small main street mom and pop businesses to reevaluate that tax burden um, would be one. Secondly would be to unravel a lot of the regulations and administrative stuff that, that, that are required of small businesses. They should have a council of actual small businesses that come in and talk to policymakers and, 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 and provide insights and say this is what it's really like. This is I, I see what you want to do here when you want to create this new mandate, but here, here's the reality on the ground of what's going to happen. There's some way to stay in tune with, with all of these things that are happening at once. I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a tax burden and then there's a regulatory burden. It's a cost and compliance epidemic, and I think you really need to s just start unraveling it. It's so massive that it can't happen overnight, but I think if there's a new sort of direction, then I think that there could be change, but it's a lot. Brian, you mentioned that you spend about 70 hours a week on your restaurant. What mm. do you do? What is your <laughs> day like? Uh, it's interesting. It's, it's nonstop. It's constant, and it is a balance of the working in the restaurant and working on the restaurant. Any given day can find me running down to the local bakery and picking up rolls to uh, a new CO2 tank for the beer taps uh, to spending um, a few hours uh, working through administrative stuff, you know, doing maybe my payroll or, uh, but I'm, I'm working almost every waking hour and when I'm not, I'm trying to spend quality time with my family. So that's, a, I think, a balance that a lot of small business owners have, but when, when you are the one responsible for so many aspects of the business, you know, I don't have a team of attorneys, I don't have accountants, I don't have folks that can help me find the workarounds you really literally end up doing everything um, from top to bottom. So you're not getting vacations as much. You're working on often on holidays, on weekends, uh, nights. It's, uh, it's a very demanding, demanding schedule. Brian, are you going to continue with your restaurant based on what you're seeing and the experience you've had so far? Well, we're right now at the point where, uh, you know, the, the spring is here and the summer is here and it's a good season for us and, and that sort of thing. So I always get a little bit of optimism, but I, the, the fact of the matter is is that I, uh, I don't plan on continuing. I'm looking to uh, move on and uh, try something else. The sad truth of it all is that I would, going forward, I would not plan to open a new business in California right now. Um, and I think that uh, this particular business in the restaurant th that we have is uh, is unsustainable, you know, without major changes, so. Now, Brian, do you have any thoughts for Californians? My hope is that we will, you know, going forward, really value these Main Street assets and small businesses and, and support them. In my community, there's a formula retail ban, which means you can't have a McDonald's or a fast food place or a chain of any sort. So what you have left are these mom and pop scale businesses, and I hope that, uh, we can really figure out as a, as a state to how to support these businesses because they're so vital. If I were asked by a young entrepreneur about opening a small business in California right now, I would tell them delicately that it's not the right place in the right time, <laughs> sadly. And, I, and it really pains me to say that um, because I've done my due diligence working in small business entrepreneurship in the state for for more than 20 years. So my message is, is that we have to make our voices heard uh, at the state level so that policymakers will get to the point of, instead of resignation of saying, well, that's just the way it is, it's gonna be more along the lines of what can we do proactively to, to really help support these businesses. And, and then as customers that are going out to eat, if they can afford it, to really to see and value those businesses and understand that if oftentimes there's a lot going on behind the scenes that you don't see when you go to a restaurant and a lot of work and uh, a lot of tireless work 
Excellent. We hope that things will get better for the restaurateurs. Brian Back, owner of Waste Station, it was great to have you on California Insider. Thank you so much, CMAC. It was great to be here. I appreciate it. We have an exciting news for you. At California Insider, we created a new product. It's called California Insider Opinion. This is where our insiders and experts across the state are actually telling you what's going on behind the headlines. When there is a breaking news, a big issue, important issue happening in California, they're going to come on the screen and tell you what's happening behind the scenes. And these are like seven to 10 minutes of opinion formats where the guests are talking to the camera directly, telling you what's happening. You're paying a tax increase of tens of thousands of dollars every year as a condition of keeping what you already own. Make sure to look at the description below because you want to sign up on our newsletter because a lot of these opinions might be very sensitive that some people in the social media platform may not like. So we're putting them in the newsletter on our website so you can have them. These opinions will actually help you understand the political and policy landscape of California. We highly recommend you follow it.